All right, my financially intentional people, I am super juiced to be joined here with my good friend, Annalise, and I'm just honored to be able to know her, to be in her presence because she is one of those people that you just need to have in your life just because she's a good human being, but also because she has a wealth of financial knowledge, but I want her to share her story on her own. So welcome, welcome, and so Annalise, excited to hear your story. Welcome, of course, to the Financially Intentional Podcast. But I just want you to break down, like, basically your, like, background in personal finance. How did you get started? All right. Well, Nasima, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. It's been almost a year since FinCon, so I think it's long overdue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, yeah, thanks for having me on your podcast to tell you a little bit about me, my story. So I'm actually a CPA by trade, even though I don't do much CPA work anymore these days. So I'm a CPA turned personal finance author, podcaster, and educator. And also I am an agency owner, and I'm sure we'll get to that later today. But to tell you how I got into this space, so really over the past 15 years, I've got really interested in personal finance. That's what made me launch my personal finance focused platform called Dream of Legacy. And with that, my goal is to normalize Black wealth, normalize investing, leaving a legacy and educating the next generation. But I would like to kind of like take it back how I even got interested in this, right? So I grew up in a household where personal finance was, it wasn't necessarily talked about, but I I witnessed a lot of healthy financial habits. I heard conversations about investing. My mother used to always tell me, no matter how much money you make, always at least set aside 20%. Don't borrow money. So just those little basic things that can go a very long way, right? So I, I started, I made my first budget when I was 13 years old. And I've been budgeting (laughs) ever since then, (laughs) right? And so when I started working, so I worked for a public accounting firm and among other CPAs. And what I noticed is that a lot of my peers, especially the ones who looked like me, didn't have the luxury that I had growing up of having parents who were financially literate. And we were talking and a lot of them were recovering from personal finance mistakes that really they made because they didn't have the information. So... It made me think about, okay, what what I wanted to do. So I started this blog called Dream of Legacy, where I was just talking about my personal finance journey. At that point, my husband and I had reached Coast Fire, which is essentially, for people who are not familiar with that, is when you have enough money invested so that you don't have to necessarily worry about retirement, right? So I was at a point where I wanted to do some, I was getting tired of the accounting finance work, and I wanted to do something that was more meaningful. And I remember reading the statistic about Black wealth, the median Black wealth being expected to go down to zero by 2053, which is not, we're not going to let that happen, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) But that's what motivated me to write my first book called Dream of Legacy, Raising Strong and Financially Secure Black Kids. And from there, I started doing, at the time, I was doing some one-on-one coaching, and then I decided to get start telling stories about people who overcame their financial difficulties. And that inspired me to launch a, an agency that actually helps not only black and brown educators, entrepreneurs who are in the wealth building space or coaching space, help them amplify their story. And we do that through storytelling, through brand strategy and other things. Long story yeah. short. <laughs> That no, but that was so good. But you touched on so many things there. And I just want to emphasize like the fact that you were taught financial literacy really early, like you came from a household where that was something that was ingrained in you, which is not a very common thing. So big up to your parents for instilling those values in you. And then just as an aside, like, where are your parents from? Oh, yes. I'm originally from Cameroon, which is right next to Nigeria, Central Africa. Yeah. Yes. Um, my, yeah, my parents are from there, went to college in France. So they had a little bit of international experience and knowledge about investment and things like that. I do want to shout Cameroon. out also, mm-hmm. 
back when I was in college, because I started investing like for myself when I was at, I believe, 20, 20 or 19, because I think it was like a marketing class. It wasn't even like a finance class. The professor was like, you guys need to really look into opening a Roth IRA. And he showed us like a compound interest. And I was like, okay, I need to get on this. Yeah, that that's a really good tool. I remember having a class in college about, and my professor telling me like to buy stock in companies that you really like, like the things that you, you're you investing in anyway. Mm. Um, but then it was the part that was missing was like, how do you do that? And it was, this was like 2000, right? So if you went to a bank, they were like, well, how much do you have to invest? Mm. And it was like a lot more gatekeeping back then. So the access that we have to be able to invest right now is like crazy considering how far we have come. You know, so that's just a, a credit, a shout out to the financial and services industry for actually dropping those barriers where we can just go online and access an account with zero fees, with no, low account minimums and things like that. So we have come a long way. Yes. <laughs> but it's, it's, I, I, yeah, it's crazy. I just remember like being like, okay, that sounds great, but I need, do I need somebody to do this for me? I remember that struggle, but for you to overcome that. So to say that is to say that that for you to overcome that was like a big deal back then. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? And it's so interesting what you're saying, right? Because at the time, so I started, I opened the Roth IRA and then I also opened a brokerage account and I was at the time, I had a lot more time. So I was actually trading, <laughs> <laughs> right? But I remember those fees, right? Every transaction. So now you can literally buy and sell and you don't even have to worry about those ten dollars per transaction fees. So right, it's, it's a lot of. Do you remember? Do you remember where you started your first account? I believe it was it was either Vanguard or Fidelity. Mm, okay. Yeah. So those are some real good companies that have been around for a long time, but still, but still, it wasn't as accessible as it is right now, where you can get into accounts with, like you said, no fees. And if you're trading, first of all. That's hella advanced. And how did you even learn training in college? <laughs> but if you're trading, like there used to be transaction fees on every buy, sell, everything yeah. that you did. So it was really expensive to be able to participate in financial markets. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so like you had a big leg up earlier on in life. And I think that's super dynamic, but also gives you the acumen to be able to provide resources for the majority of us that, you know, unintentionally, intentionally were kept from this information. So you got the information from your parents, you got a leg up from a college professor, and then you were able to partner with someone and be on the same page as someone to reach coast fire in your 20s and that's not a small feat like all of those things are some extraordinary examples of just what having a little bit of financial acumen can do it can extremely accelerate your path to financial freedom and it doesn't really it, it's not a lot in itself but combined it's it's super dynamic. So and can you talk about uh -huh. just to clarify, I, I was in my early thirties when I reached Coast Fire. Early thirties. Okay. Sorry. And, uh -huh. Yeah, early thirties. But to be honest, I didn't even know that it was a thing. Right. Like <laughs> I, I learned about it like a couple of years prior. <laughs> right, right. Right. I just had those habits without necessarily putting like a name to it or anything. And yeah. No, but that's super important because it was so just ingrained in who you are in itself that you didn't that it was just it just happened for you like it wasn't super intentional but you were already putting those cogs in the wheel so that you, you can accelerate faster and then as far as like you being able to be on the same page with your partner that's also crazy because most people that's usually the number one reason why people break up not being on the same page financially, financial infidelity, like just not understanding finances and not coming into their relationship, uh, being able to even communicate about finances. How was that with your husband? Like, 
when you guys first started dating or talking, was he raised the same way? Like, how does how did that all work? <laughs> no, my husband was completely different. Different <laughs> when it comes to personal finance, he he was he was budgeting always. He was saving, doing a little bit of investing through work, but not necessarily looking like I I always like to project like 10, 15 years from now. And really, to get him on board, all I had to do was hey, at the time it was like heavy spreadsheet. And still to this day, <laughs> hey, here's the projection. If we invest this much, here's where we can be 10 years from now, 15 years from now. And then from, from there, the sacrifice makes sense, right? Because you're working towards a goal. But if I had approached him just saying, hey, we need to invest and <laughs> not really without a plan, that wouldn't have worked. And what we always, mm-hmm. what we also did along the way, though, is that travel is important for me. So we always set money aside for travel. So we, we were never like, let's just cut everything off and never spend, never enjoy our life. But we did always set aside what we needed first, invested that. And then the the difference, we would do whatever we needed to do with it. Right. I love that. I love that. And I love how you just broke down the numbers. Listen, honey, this is what it's going to be. But also, that is important to understand that people can come from different backgrounds and different financial situations and still make it work. And I, and I love the fact that you always made sure that you budgeted in your fund because that that's what keeps it going. Like to be able to fund the lifestyle and that, and ultimately that's what financial independence is about. It's about being able to mm-hmm. buy freedom, right? And those freedoms for you were traveling and to be able to incorporate that into how you guys shaped your money story is super important. And so I really love that. And that's a lesson for everyone, you know, about getting your finances together is really about making sure that you are paying for things, are are still enjoying your life along the way. So you heavily spend on things that you enjoy, but then you also get to take a look at the things that, you know, you're paying for that don't really bring any joy into your life. And so that's what like really being intentional about your finances is. And I think that's a lot of the piece that people are missing is because we spend so much money just on BS Mm. every day that we don't understand that there's if we if we cut out that spending that really we can't even go back and see what was that we spent money on like how did that benefit us and just really be intentional about just leaning into those things that really bring us joy you don't miss the other stuff that you quote unquote can't buy anymore right that is so true like I'm a big big fan of value-based spending I I used to spend money on things and I'm pretty sure I still do now on things (laughs) that I don't necessarily necessarily value as much right but I'm a lot more intentional about it and I don't feel guilty any like if I'm spending money 95% of the time it's because I value it and once when I value it then I'm not going to feel guilty versus if I'm going to spend a ton of money on something that I don't care about as much, a pair of really, really expensive shoes, then the, a month later, I might, I might, I might be like, ah, was I really, did I really want to buy that? So I think it's very important to be clear on what you value and mm-hmm. then base your spending on that after obviously meeting all of your financial goals and setting money aside, investing for your retirement and for the things that you care about. Yeah. And then I just want to go back to the fact that you started taking these money lessons and you started sharing them like on your blog. And I want to talk about what were some of the things that surprised you when you started sharing your story about the responses that you got from other people? So I think the most, what I realized is that a lot of the things that I thought were just normal weren't. So I had to really go back to the basis, the basics, right? Because earlier I I shared that my mother told me about budgeting. I wasn't even 10 years old. I started budgeting at 13. So to me, budgeting is normal, right? But in talking to people, you realize that, first of all, not not, not everyone budgets and there's a lot of people who are actually even scared of the word budget because Mm -hmm. they feel like it's very restrictive so it's just I think 
for me, that was like one of the, the things that really surprised me. And so I, I had to really like start from scratch and stop assuming that people knew anything and just really start from like the very, very, very basic level. Yes. And you're realizing yes. that when you're, when you're explaining things, because sometimes it's like the term that is intimidating, right? But when you're explaining it in like a everyday type of scenario, then people get it and they understand why it's important. Even like investing, as you mentioned before, or as we talked about before, it can be very intimidating to start investing. But once you are able to show people like how you can literally, you don't have to pick an individual stock. You can yes. literally start this online with a couple of clicks. You don't have to have mm-hmm. a ton of money to start. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, the barriers to entry or the perceived barrier to entry start disappearing and people are more interested and ready to get started. Yeah. And I think that's super, that's why it's super important that you have your platform because like I said, like whether it's intentional or not, a lot of this information has been gatekept or made like overcomplicated Mm -hmm. to keep number one so that you have to go to somebody or turn to somebody mm-hmm. to help you with stuff, which you really don't necessarily need to. So that's a way to get you to pay for something that mm-hmm. you could technically do on your own. But but also because it's just there haven't been many voices like ours in this space historically. And that's why it's important that we share. And when you're talking about the black net worth, like the black wealth, like going to zero, like it's a really real thing because what ends up happening is we don't have the outlet and the resources or the cousin or the family CPA or any Mm -hmm. personal finance. I mean, a family person in the finance space that we can turn to that can just help us. A lot of us are just doing the best that we can Absolutely. with what we have. And also, like I'm one generation removed from a whole lot of black people that were unbanked, that were totally taken advantage of from the financial institutions. And there's a lot of mistrust, rightfully so. And so it's just a lot of financial trauma, for lack of better words, that we've had to deal with and overcome that have led us on this path to where while everybody else is growing their wealth, our wealth is slowly dwindling because we're not able to pass down the wealth from generation to generation because of a myriad of factors. But a lot of it is just right now not knowing who to trust and turn to and a lot of miseducation. And so platforms like yours, platforms like mine are super important to highlight that, listen, like we understand, we get it. And here's how we move forward. And I know your focus is really heavily on building generational wealth. And I think it's amazing that you come from a family where you're celebrating like successful years of your family having successful entrepreneurial endeavors, businesses, but I want to know like how that is helping you shape passing money on to the next generations in your family. It's very interesting, right? I'm a big believer in God and I believe that God is preparing like every step of the way God is preparing you for what's coming next. And when I started getting really interested about this topic of generational wealth at the time, so my family, one of, one of, I guess, our main business is real estate. And we've had this business for, we just celebrated 40 years. But at that time, I, for most of my life, really, I just wanted to do my own thing. <laughs> so I was not interested in working for the family business. I never even worked in the family business until recently, a couple of years ago, when my father passed away. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I didn't, well... I don't want to say that I didn't have a choice, but when you realize all of the sacrifices that were made to get you to to this point, like you have, you barely have a choice, but to keep it going for the next generation, right? So when I started talking about generational wealth and my journey about in this personal finance space, I didn't even know that, or I was still delusional that (laughs) I would somehow stay away from the family business. But I'm now the CEO of the family business that happened over the past two years. 
And I've had to learn a lot more about this generational wealth space, especially as a business owner, and also just learning how to balance that with my own business. But one of the things that I think what is very, very important and was very valuable is that my father really planned things out. So there was, there was no, no confusion in terms of the vision, what he wanted to happen in the next, let's foreseeable future. And also everyone or all of my siblings were involved somehow, some way. And I think it really even got it tightens the bond now because now we have this legacy that we want to uphold for the next generation. So I started having conversation even with my kids. My kids are nine and six. I have six-year-old twins. And my nine-year-old, I I think it was like last summer, we were in my father, my parents' room. And there was this, that that was my last, my father's last project. Mm -hmm. He built this seven-story building and he was like already in his early early 80s right (laughs) and I remember having a conversation with him come on (laughs) like you need to be relaxing retiring anything but what you're doing right now but he was like no I'm doing this I'm thinking about my grandkids and at the time honestly I was like that is a lot (laughs) but today I'm like okay now I I even understand, I understand even more like the level of sacrifices because there's no way he's doing that at 80 for himself. Right. Wait, and so seven story building, where is that? Is it here or is it it's Cameroon? in Cameroon? It's okay. In Cameroon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's in Cameroon. And so, but yeah, last summer, my, my oldest daughter was talking to my two youngest who were five at the time. And my oldest went, with eight and she was showing them the plan and she was like yeah this granddaddy built this uh, for people to live and this is the building that you see over here so i'm like okay so they're they're understanding already Mm -hmm. right we're staying in an apartment i'm like okay this apartment your grandparents built and so i'm thinking that the more we have these conversations and we understand or they understand what the, the generation before them had to do to get to where we are, the more involved they're going to be and the more they're going to want to continue to make it grow. Yeah, I like that phrase, like more is caught than taught. Like you can tell your, you can tell your kids like what they should be doing with their money and like how it should be spent or how they should be pro- provide for the next generation. But actually like seeing it, and I love that. I think that that's the value of like real estate is that you actually have physical property. It's a little bit harder with stocks, right? Mm -hmm. But you actually have the physical evidence that you can live in, that you can just visit and see, to see that this is mine. Like my family owns this. My grandfather built this for me. That is super impactful. But let, let, let's talk a little bit more like about your, like the family business that you started. I mean, that was started like, so your dad, did he immigrate here eventually? Or did he stay in Cameroon and start those businesses? Or like, how did that work? Yeah. So my parents, no, my parents never lived in the U.S. I moved here for college. Right. So they at some point they lived in France. And then when they started their professional career or early in their professional career, they decided to move back to Cameroon and help build their country. So when my father actually started, he's a pharmacist, but that's what he went to school for. And his pharmacy, which was his first business, actually celebrated 50 years last year. Wow. Awesome. But yeah, so my, so they never, they never lived here. My, my mom, my mother is a doctor. Well, retired now. Uh, But yeah, they, they studied in France, moved back home and built their businesses there. So all the businesses that they have are based in Cameroon. So the real estate business, is it mostly commercial businesses or or residential or a mix? It's mixed. It's both residential and commercial. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. So, and then how many siblings do you have? So I have three siblings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, so, so when your dad was doing all this, he had everything all planned out, like 
which of the siblings were going to get everything. And I mean, which of the siblings were going to get a portion of which business mm-hmm. and X, Y, and Z. So he had his, he had his estate planning in order. Oh yes. His estate planning was in, was in order. He actually went a step further. So as I mentioned, like my, it was not in my, in my right mind, I wasn't thinking about taking over the family real estate business, but because I think my dad knew that <laughs> that was not part of my plan, he also was, she told me, <laughs> right? So, but when he told me that that was his plan, I thought, oh, I have 10 years, <laughs> right? Like, it's, I don't have to worry about this. I can just focus on what I'm doing. But he ended up passing away from COVID. And oh, so sorry. things got, yeah. thank you got kind of like escalated. But yeah, he had his estate plan in order, which is something that I just emphasize, right? Because like when you're grieving, the last thing you want to do is now try to figure out what your loved one would have wanted, whether it's from like funeral arrangement or if you have little ones or dependents, you want to make sure that they're taken care of and have like life insurance. Those things are so important. And I like to say that it's the last gift that you can give to your loved ones. Yes. And then was it even more complicated because were you in the States or were you in Cameroon at that time? I was here when everything happened. Okay. Yes, I was here. So now one of the things that has really changed in my life is that I have to travel a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yes. But Mm -hmm. the beauty is that real estate is not as intense. We do manage our own properties, but it's not as intense as if I were, if it was like a product based business. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why I even have the luxury to go back and forth. (laughs) Right. And let's not forget (laughs) that that is not your only business. So like you have your personal finance business, but then you also have a PR business like, and those are your like main businesses. So let's zoom back out (laughs) and kind of talk about those things. Like we know about the personal finance, but how did you get into the more PR space? Yeah. So Interestingly enough, right, when I started sharing stories of people, personal finance stories and writing about them for different publications, I have one person who approached me about just, hey, do you have like PR tips on relationships and do you want to work with me in that capacity? I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> I'll give it a try and see. So I'm going to give you six months and see where it goes. And so I work with this one particular client and her brand really, um, really expanded during the time that we worked together and more people starting asking me about this. So I don't do, I always like to say, I'm not really like a publicist. I'm at the intersection of, so I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. But so, so the work that we do at my agency is at the intersection of brand strategy, brand management and PR. So we use PR as one of the tools but it's not it's not a PR agency. But I thought it made a lot a lot more a lot of sense, right? Because earlier I said I'm on a mission to normalize black wealth and I'm serving these black women who are really like killing it in their space, in trailblazers, helping others either make more money or build wealth. And so it's only helping amplify my mission. Right. Like yeah. I don't have to be the one doing it if I can uh, help someone else in the space get in front of more people, then it's still furthering the mission. Yes. I love that. And I love that you just took those relationships that you were organically building and helping people get in front of the right people to expand their brands and their voices. Cause we know that often we don't get the same recognition as other people do, mm-hmm. even if we do That's the same fact. or greater work. And so sometimes those little legs up can be a significant difference in us getting exposure. Um, Yeah. And it's interesting, right? Because people ask me about this PR work, because as I I mentioned, I don't see myself as like a publicist (laughs) or someone who's in the PR space specifically, but it's very interesting. I keep hearing the stories. I work with this PR and that PR and they promised me the moon and nothing happened. And that's one of the things that I don't do is make promises. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? um, yes. Because I, it's worked out for me that way. I'm, I'm able to under promise, over deliver. 
Yes, and I and I've seen your work, and you do deliver. <laughs> so that'll <laughs> sleep you. on Annalise. <laughs> but Annalise, let's talk about what's coming up for you now. I know you have to travel a lot. You still have young kids that you're raising. Like, first of all, how do you do it all? And second of all, like, what should we be looking out for from you? Well, support. I think my my husband is able to step in every time that if he wasn't supportive, I probably wouldn't be able to be gone as much without feeling like everything is under control. So having the right support system is key for me, but also just having flexibility. Like for instance, the past two summers, my kids, my family, actually, we spent the summer in Cameroon most of the summer, right? So it's like, all right, I need to go there for work anyways. (laughs) So how about we just all go together so that they can also experience my home country and have uh, an experience of living in Africa for a while. And we go there. But is your your husband from Cameroon as well? No, my husband is from Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire. Oh, Côte d'Ivoire. Yeah. yeah. But also a Francophone country. (laughs) Exactly. So at least he speaks French. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But that's cool. So, but I mean, it's not like completely foreign. It's not like taking an American that's never been to to Africa Africa and be like, we about to get this experience. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. The the, the thing about my husband is that he just adapts to like any environment. Like even the first time he went to Cameroon, right? Like he eats even more local food than I do. Like, (laughs) First so, of all, like Cameroonian food is hella good if you've never okay. had it before. Like, it's one of my favorites. Really? But it's very hard to find. <laughs> I only know one place that serves it here, but yeah, it's hella good. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, I, I love, I love Cameroonian food for sure. <laughs> but yeah, as far as what, what's coming for me, just focusing on building my agency slowly but surely. So working with more clients that can help further the mission yes 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 and so you also have your you're still you still have your platform your podcast so where can people find you yes absolutely so my podcast my podcast is called the dreamers podcast and you can find it pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts also on as far as social media i have the video version of the podcast on youtube uh, under Annie's Wealth. It's A N N E L Y S E W E A L T H. And you can find me on Instagram under Annie's Wealth as well, as well as on, the, on Twitter. I don't really tweet, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, is you your can. Main platform. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you can go to dreamoflegacy.com if you want to find out more about the personal finance work and then Annie's wealth or alwagency.com if you want to find out more about the agency. And are you having your conference? Ooh, no. (laughs) (laughs) That you will. (laughs) Cancel. I mean, postponed. Yeah. Yeah, girl. I know. That's a lot of work. That is a lot of work. (laughs) But yeah, thank you for wanting to plug that in. But yeah, we're gonna. Have to <laughs> cut that it's out. all good. I just, I just know that you mentioned it. Okay, cool. So mostly Instagram, and then your website, and then everywhere podcasts in are played and on YouTube. So we have ample places to reach out to you. And I'm still trying to convince you to be my PR person. <laughs> You don't even need PR, actually. I do. (laughs) I need more strategy. (laughs) Okay, let's talk. Okay, definitely. But anyway, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And it was just great getting to learn more about your story. It's super fascinating. And I think it's just a lesson in like the things that we take for granted that we know and experience and that other people could really benefit from, you were able to put that out in a digestible way to help people and to also bring people on board to further expand that mission. And I think that that's something that shouldn't be taken lightly. And it's a lot of time. it's a lot of times people wouldn't even take that leap in sharing and the people that you were able to impact 
because you just took that leap of faith and did that. So I appreciate you. I appreciate what you do. I'm a big fan. And I just want to thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you. And I appreciate you as well. I'm glad I finally, finally made it. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, better late than never. (laughs) Thank you, Nasima. Thank you.